Maryland's 1977 football season ended as it had begun with a tremendous roar of success. My pleasure to give the winner of the first Hall of Fame Classic this trophy, which also will be duplicated in the National Hall of Fame in Kings Island, outside of Cincinnati, to Coach Jerry Claiborne of the University of Maryland. They are, and our football team got this invitation. They wanted one more opportunity to show just how what type of football team they were. And I tell you, they did it tonight, and the people here in Birmingham have got one of the greatest bowls in the country. Washington, the most intriguing city in the world, is minutes away from College Park, Maryland. So it's easy to see why life at the University of Maryland is exciting and rewarding. With Washington a next-door neighbor and Baltimore less than half an hour away, the emphasis is on being where the action is. College Park's hundreds of lush rolling acres set the tone for delightful college life. The students are the nucleus of an exciting international community drawn by location and reputation to one of America's greatest learning centers. Maryland is a member of the prestigious Association of American Universities. Over 100,000 students annually enroll in the university's vast worldwide facility. There's a continuity of style in the comfortably structured buildings on the main campus that is old, but never, never out of date. season begins at Clemson at infamous Death Valley, graveyard for ranked teams with big reputations. The rebuilding Tigers were to become the surprise team of the Atlantic Coast Conference. But in this sultry opener before 44,000 fans, the Terrapins outgained Clemson in the air, outmanned them on the ground in a leadoff bruiser. And so the Terrapins come home with a 21 to 14 win. Next, it was West Virginia in the Terrapin home opener before 45,000 fans at spacious Bird Stadium. The Mountaineers rode their quarterback's hot hand to a 24 to nothing halftime lead. The stunned Terrapins responded with a tremendous second half rush to close the gap to eight points, threatening at the very end. But early damage and an unforgiving clock denied that rally, and Maryland's long regular season winning streak was over. It was the first regular season loss in 15 games, and the first incident of that old nemesis injury began to appear. Seven thousand fans, including a very strong and vocal Maryland contingent, jammed Beaver Stadium for the resumption of the Maryland Penn State series. National television selects this game as one of its features based on past performance and pregame prospects between these two highly rated foes. Early on, Penn State's aerial arm never looked better. The Terrapins accumulate over 300 yards against the vaunted Lion defense, and for 30 minutes, the game is a standoff. Then in the gathering gloom, the Lions shut off several Terrapin thrusts. But they won't soon forget the individual effort of Dean Richards, who grabs nine passes in the Nittany secondary for 160 yards, and eventually one goes for a touchdown.
but it is not enough, and Maryland endures loss number two. Football is a game that frequently boils with controversy. No game will be more controversial than the Terrapins' early October visit to North Carolina State. Five times, the lead changes hands. A furious fourth quarter leaves 40,000 fans limp in Carter Stadium rain as State scores the winning points with less than 30 seconds to go. In the first four weeks, Maryland had played against three teams destined to go to postseason bowls, had beaten one and lost to two all on the road. Coach Jerry Claiborne reflects on where the Terrapins are now headed. Well, when our season was one in three, it was going to take a lot of character from our players and our coaches to get things started and get back on the winning track. And this is the thing. I guess I was most proud of this football team because they did have the type of character that it took to regroup and then put their minds to really what had to be done and go out and start winning. And at the time when it was one and three, it didn't look too good. I think our team proved that we do have a sound, solid program, and we do have outstanding people in this program. Because if it hadn't, we would not have come back from one and three and finished up eight and four. The shakedown cruise is over. Forgetting about last year's reputation, the herding Terrapins regroup against dangerous Syracuse. Over 5,000 high school musicians gather for Maryland's traditional band day in a color and music spectacular. Rain dampens some options, but not the Terrapin enthusiasm. After a standoff first quarter, the Terrapins generate an almost perfect blend, 187 rushing yards and 186 passing yards. The win is costly. A pass completion produces a first down and a broken hand for quarterback Mark Mangus. But in this department, the Terrapins are well manned. Senior signal caller Larry Dick steps in without breaking stride, pilots the Terrapins to a 24 to 10 win, showing the same poise and ability he and Mangus had lent to Maryland quarterbacking for four brilliant seasons. On October the 15th, Maryland evens its season record with a pulverizing 35-7 win over Wake Forest. A 21-point second period splurge featuring two Steve Atkins touchdowns in his 142-yard afternoon assure the win. The senior aerial battery combination of Larry Dick to Chuck White gets ample exposure as the agile White snares everything tossed his way, including a touchdown pass that was a classic. Supporting the Maryland football team in its 100-yard wars are those volatile packages of vocal dynamite called the cheerleaders. Co-captain Debbie Schweitzer exemplifies the Maryland squad, which is an energy level that knows no limits. We've got spirit! It takes a lot of enthusiasm to be a cheerleader. We have a job that we have to try to incite the crowd because, as a lot of studies have shown, that it's a home court or home field advantage is very important. So it's our job to get a reaction from the crowd. People are getting back to, um, you know, go Terps go and Maryland football and rah-rah and things like that. And it makes our job a lot easier when they have a good attitude coming to the game. 
the female population looks on the football players, I think, in two different ways. There's like, they put on the pedestal, and then there are people that like want to get to know them. So there's a, a mystique about them. I feel like the guys that are here and that have been coming here, I think they're, they're good boys. I mean, you have to be good to be able to live and play by Claiborne's rules. I think people feel that way about them. You can even tell just by the, by the players themselves how they are on the field and off the field. They're, they're nice people. They're a nice group of people. A young man on the spot in 1977 was Jonathan Claiborne, walk-on, two-year starter, son of the head coach. Claiborne's performance in the classroom earned him a scholarship from the National Football Foundation and Hall of Fame, one of only 11 scholar-athletes in the country so honored. Playing football at Maryland and, and going to school at the same time, it's worked out really well for me. It's a good academic school. I happen to be in the business uh, program, and it's, it's got a really good business school. And I've been fortunate enough that most of my teachers have, have really been excellent and the, the curriculum has been excellent. I've, it's in the Washington, D.C. area where coming out of school there's a lot of job opportunities and I think football tends to maybe open a couple doors kind of point you in the right direction and that you find out that teamwork and salesmanship, uh, outgoingness, confidence, a lot of those things that you learn in football are really valuable out in the uh, business world too. So I think football has helped me develop some personal skills and personal attributes that hopefully will become valuable to me in the future. Duke's Blue Devils rolled into Bird Stadium intent on reversing their string of losses to the Terrapins. Terrapin Infantry and Air Force produce a 400-yard afternoon to crush the Devils 31 to 13. Alvin Preacher Maddox takes a personal hand in abetting the Terrapin offense with this score. Steve Atkins puts 225 pounds to work to tally three times. <laughs> Strong defensive line play has been a Terrapin hallmark. Among the best performers in the nation this year is all-conference and all-American mentioned defensive guard Ted Clowby. Playing in Maryland's told me to be a leader and help work with the other guys on the team. I guess it's built my character so When I get ready for the game, I try to keep, uh, think about the things at night when you sleep, you know. Keep pitching yourself going through the uh, plays, pitch yourself making tackles. If you see yourself doing these things, believe me, it really helps. It really, you can do it in the game. Plus, I like, I like to practice. When I do it, practice I like the hustle of practice and stuff like that. That way, I could, uh, you know, they say you play the way you practice, and I feel that's really helped me a great deal. Which, uh, my attitude in practice, I think, has helped you know, a couple of guys on the team, especially my uh, fellow defensive guards. Like, you can tell just at practice, we, we're always working hard. You want to try to free up these linebackers. So get off of that ball and butt that man. Well, my relations with Coach Seekers is, uh, I think, a really good one because Coach Seekers was an uh, outstanding ball player when he played, and uh, I think he's one of the finest coaches out there because he knows the type of situation you're going to be in. He knows uh, what kind of play they're going to run on th certain downs, and he just he does a great job with the defensive guard. He, it's a more of like a defensive guards and Coach Seekers is like sort of like a small family. We're really close, and I think that helps us more than anything. Coach Claiborne's a great, he's a disciplinarian, you know, and he's tough on and off the field. He's always constantly uh, aware of that, and it just builds a better person. And by building a better person, it gets you a better football player. 
The last weekend in October produces the major conference battle of the year. It's Maryland versus North Carolina. The impact of this game is so great that television again selects it as a major feature of its Saturday football fair. Both teams are noted for their defenses, and early on, an errant Tar Heel throw is intercepted by Lloyd Burris and returned for 63 yards to set up the initial Terrapin tally. The two teams rip at each other for three quarters to go into the final stanza knotted at 7-7. Seven to seven. Then in the final 15 minutes, the Tar Heels get the foot into their football with three field goals to post the stubborn Terrapins 16 to 7. The Terrapins' three consecutive league titles and 21-game winning streak leave a mark the rest of the ACC will have difficulty in equally. Five thousand fans brave a showery Saturday to welcome Villanova's Wildcats. The KG Cats hardly assumed the role of kittens in a game for which they now traditionally point. The Terrapins use their passing game early. But on this muggy afternoon, the name on everybody's lips is Scott. George Scott, the native New Yorker, sets a school record with 42 carries while gaining 237 yards overland. Oh yes, he also caught two passes just so he wouldn't lose interest in this, his most memorable start. While Scott was shouldering the offense, Charlie Johnson, wearing number 99, has Maryland's biggest defensive day shutting off the Cats crawler. The 110-piece Maryland band, dressed in their black and gold finery, perform with great distinction wherever they go. Lyrical licks from trumpeter Melissa Crumpke brighten up any game day. Like the, the music department, the bands, and the athletic department have really been working hand in hand. Um, on the Jerry Claiborne show, Coach Claiborne always says, you know, we thank the band for being there. And when we send a pep band down from the away game, the cheerleaders are always right in front of us. And the team, when we walk by, they look and they'll wave. It just makes you feel like we're all there for the same reason. I feel I have contributed personally because um, I'm out there sweating for 15 hours a week and getting yelled at and screamed at along with everyone else. And, getting dressed up in a stuffy hot band uniform on Saturdays. I enjoy doing it as much as I do, and I love it. But um, we work really hard, and I think we practice and put in as much effort in what we do as the football team does. To us, it's almost a sport. It's not just any other class. You would skip your cycle 100, but if you ever skip marching bands, forget it. It's something you don't dare think about. Um, I feel we, we play just an, an important a role as any athletic um, team on campus. Vince Kinney is one of the most gifted receivers in Maryland history. The glue-fingered Baltimorean is as articulate off the field as he is on it, making communication with an audience on his own radio show. Hey, 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 this is Vinnie Kenny here, the man who will definitely give you plenty. The time now is 5.15 and 27 seconds. The date is 12.28 and it's chilly outside. If you're going outside, put some heavy wrappings on. This is Fat Daddy Gugu Mugache, Mo Bip Mo Kev. Your heart could take it, come fly with me. Hey, work out. I'm playing a nice record today by Diana Ross. It's called Baby, You Got It. And it's for Joanne Green, a dedication for a foxy lady down there in Morgantown and Beemore. So I want you to sit back and listen. This is for you, Joanne Green. Came to Maryland because of Coach Claiborne. He had a very good record, and he impressed me as being a very good coach. And the atmosphere around here, so many things to do, so many places to go. And it wasn't, it didn't take my whole vacation to get home. The thing that impressed me about Coach Claiborne was his attitude, the way he came to my house, he talked to me, he 
talked football, he talked about life, he talked how he was going to be interested in us, not only as football players, but as human beings, and that impressed me a lot. You know, you have to go somewhere for four years, you're going to have to enjoy that place where you go, you know. And it was Maryland, we travel first class, we eat first class, we do things first class, and Maryland is known to have a very top, you know, athletic department, as far as their weights, as far as their program, as far as everything, so I'm not sorry that I made the decision to come to Maryland. The way they run things here, a lot of professional scouts like the way Claiborne has his winter program, his spring program, how he gets his guys in shape, and the kind of record is, you know, that just shows the kind of program is here, you know. It couldn't be just athletes here. We have to be doing something right. We're getting to the pros, and there are pros like Walter White. There are pros like Randy White, Lou Carter, you know, name them. There's a whole lot of them. Bob Graber, Kenny Shore, Bob Avellini, of course. He's doing it with the Bears now. These guys made it, and that gives you that feeling where I can make it too, you know. I can go through Maryland and have a good career and also go to the pros and make it. So it's, it's just great. This is Diana Ross you're listening to. Time now is 5.17. This is Vinny Kenny, and I will be here until 6.05. Right now, let's take a time out for this station break. <laughs> The University of Richmond scheduled its game with Maryland as part of the now famous Shrine Bowl activities. Midway in the first quarter, a new offensive wrinkle in the Terrapin scheme sends fullback Mickey Dudish on a 50-yard scamper. With the prospective bowl bid still in sight, all phases of the Terrapin defense and offense begin to gel. <laughs> Against the Spiders, the Terrapins are powered by territory-grabbing George Scott, who cruises for 171 more yards. A late challenge by the Spiders falls shy, and Maryland posts its sixth win of the season. Final regular season scenario is played at College Park, where arch rival Virginia pays a visit. A probable bowl bid is on the Terrapin's mind as the opening kickoff is returned deep into Cavalier territory, setting up a pattern that was the feature for the day. The result was a well-contrived shutout, with George Scott's 173 yards the key offensively. With the shutout assured, the Terrapins find Hall of Fame Bowl President Fred Sington on hand to greet them in their locker room. I'd like to say this, gentlemen, that it was a fine ball game. Birmingham, Alabama is proud to announce and ask you to come to Birmingham. Well, when we got the bowl bid uh, to play in the Hall of Fame Classic, I was very happy. 
number one, uh, because it gave our football team an opportunity to participate in a bowl and to also show people that our football team was stronger than our 7-4 record indicated. For the fifth consecutive season, the Terrapins were appearing in a major postseason game, and Birmingham opened its arms for the Terrapins. The treatment was first class, perhaps the best ever. And for the young Terrapins, this turnaround season with its booming finale proved that Jerry Claiborne was right when he called for extra effort during mid-season adversity. Birmingham was a beehive of activity and Maryland's players made a host of friends and new fans at Children's Hospital. banquet was a spectacular success enjoyed by all members of Maryland's athletic establishment. The handsome trophy symbolic of the Hall of Fame Bowl victory resides in the Terrapin College Park Showcase, taking its place beside nine other reminders of Maryland's postseason bowl appearances. And so for Jerry Claiborne and his crew, it was a marvelous climax to another banner year. Well, I think our team learned from this season that uh, uh, when things you want uh, don't come easy, and sometimes uh, they don't happen at all. And I know that uh, a lot of the goals that we set as a football team at the beginning of the year, we did not accomplish this year. And sometimes that's gonna happen to you in life. And I think that our football team learned that uh, you have setbacks as well as, uh, as victories. And uh, after coming off 11-0 season and finishing up this year 8-4, as I look back on it, I think that uh, maybe as people uh, and as lessons that we learned and values we learned, this season might have been even more important than the Lehman O season uh, because it was all winning and it's a lot easier to go out and practice and uh, play and do things that are a little tough when you're winning. But when you're uh, in a losing streak, as we were back when we won in three, it takes, it's a lot tougher to go out there on that field and prepare and get your minds and your bodies right to get back on the winning track. And so I think that our players are going to find out in life that there's going to be some setbacks. And, but I think this season really helped them to be able to cope with this. And there's no doubt in my mind that uh, these men uh, will be successful when they get out in life and, and things don't go exactly like they uh, want them to do. They'll know where it is to reach down and get that little extra and, and go ahead and be successful. For Jerry Claiborne's coaching associates, that final December performance in Birmingham was pure delight. Terrapin offense was directed by Jerry Eisman, the quarterback coach, Tommy Groom, who coaches the setbacks, Jake Callum, whose responsibility is the offensive line, and Morgan Hout, who works with the talented receiver. defense was awesome. The pregame preparation was provided by George Fasekis, Gib Romain and Rod Sharpless who tutor the line, John Devlin who coaches the linebackers, and Terry Strzok who teaches the deep secondary. Defensive aggressiveness reached a peak in the second half when the muscular young Terrapins pinned the bulkier Gophers with as assertive a defense as the Northlanders had seen all year by Minnesota's own admission. Dick Redding and Jerry Claiborne, who have been associates for so many seasons together, could savor every delicious moment of victory over a capable foe from the Big Ten. As Vince Kinney so alertly pointed out, in his playing years at Maryland, Kinney's teammates had included NFL runners and receivers Walter White, Ricky Jennings, Lewis Carter, and Bob Rabon. 
Bob Avellini was the starting quarterback for Chicago, and Joe Campbell, an All-American lineman, was a top draft choice. The Terrapins watched with pride as members of recent Terrapin teams who were major contributors to Maryland's football resurgence were also important factors in the success of the professional teams for whom they played. In the recent Super Bowl, Maryland's incomparable Randy White has become a devastating Dallas Cowboy defensive lineman. And the Denver Broncos have utilized John Schultz as an all-purpose performer. It is no accident that successful programs produce successful people in and out of football. The Terrapin victory over Minnesota produced two individual honors a coveted trophy for Chuck White, the offensive player of the game with his eight receptions for 126 yards. And Charlie Johnson, the defensive tackle, who had four quarterback sacks among 17 tackles to emerge as the game's most valuable defensive performer. But in every sense, this was a team victory. And so the message was obvious. Terrapin football players enjoy a football success that is uncommon. <laughs>